The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. So, greetings. My name is Andrew Pasaltis. I am a uh, software, software engineer at Akamai Technologies, and I am going to talk to you about the joy of Perl. So, back when I uh, was asking some of my uh, coworkers for uh, to review my material, um, one of the first comments I heard is that uh, one of the last things he expected to even s to see in the same sentence was joy in Perl. Because uh, of its well-known reputation for being a write-only language. So, let's do this. So, oh, Perl. What is Perl? As many of you know, Perl is a uh, language most notably, most notably used in the field of text processing. It, is, it was made in 1987 by a man named Larry Wall, and it is still maintained to this day. There have been a total of five versions of Perl that are uh, based on the original version. There's now a Perl 6, but it isn't, that's different from what is most commonly used today. Everyone uses Perl 5 or some variant thereof. And Perl is very no, well known for text processing, right? That is like what Perl is really well known for. But what Perl, what you can do, those text processing features, while important, can be used in other ways. Like you can go and write code that doesn't just does generic scripting, like say something that would be more used for Python scripts. There are Perl modules that do pretty much everything on Earth, and it can be used to pretty much do pretty much anything on Earth. So without further ado, here's an example of Perl. <laughs> Off the top of anyone's head, does anyone know what this, what this does? This is actually valid. This is actually valid Perl. I'll just go, uh, I'll go run it for you. So, just another Perl hacker. Uh, it's a part of generally part of an obfuscated code contest. They would go and have something that would go and print out just the string, just another Perl hacker in some form, using in as most obfuscated ways possible. There's some that don't even use any. For example, there's some that don't even use any uh, ASCII characters, rather than ASCII characters. Uh, alphanumeric characters. One is a bunch of gibberish. There's actually even, there's a guy who wrote a program that makes, generates programs like this that print out text, just like just another Perl hacker right there. Uh, all right. So one of the things that uh, people often ask about Perl is that does it stand for anything? And the answer to that question is no, it does not. There are uh, numerous uh, backronyms for Perl. I will uh, discuss them shortly, but for more, but for more, but Perl itself does not stand for anything. And for emphasis, Perl is not an acronym. All right, now that I've gone through all of the heavy gulky introductory stuff, let's do, let's talk about Perl. So one of the uh, things you go into, you deal with in uh, Perl, you see at the top of almost every other every script is the is use. So what is use? In the practical extraction report language, use is used as an import statement or a compiler directive, meaning you load a module or you instruct the compiler to act differently based on what you pass to it. Sometimes it can be used for loading features, uh, changing how Perl, the Perl parser works. Speaking of changing how the Perl parser works, if you don't use this in your code, in your Perl scripts, if it's more than uh, two or three lines long, a kitten, that will, kitten will die. <laughs> Uh, what this, this does is it prevents a lot of <coughs> mistakes can be made. One of, the, uh, one of the things you do with Perl is you often write out function calls. And as you probably, a lot of people, anyone, anyone who has used Perl has seen, almost all the variables are always prefixed with some sort of gobbledygook, non alphanumeric character. Um, if you make a typo with that, it's, Perl will, uh, if you don't use strict, Perl will um, give you a funny look, but will continue to, we'll, we'll try to do something with that subroutine or non-existent subroutine, as it were, and that is bad. This is just a, it also enforces good code practice, like 
always giving your variable, just saying what vari scope your variables are, and other things. Just, just use it. It doesn't, you don't lose any, you, there is no detraction from not using it except maybe from code brevity. If you're using a one-liner, you don't need to use strict because your code's probably gonna be incomprehensible anyway. And there's no point in continuing onward. Um, there's two other compiler pragmas that are uh, less important, but quite useful. Use warnings. It the Perl compiler contains a lot of useful warnings. And use warnings is one way to enable such warnings. Um, use diagnostics is a different story. So sometimes the, you get Perl, Perl goes and writes out some junk to the, you made a mistake. Perl writes something to the command line saying, you use this undefined thing here. And like, what if you use, di and there's like, okay, it's undefined. So if you have used diagnostics enabled, Perl will say, oh yeah, it's undefined. Here, are all, here is a list of all the possible reasons why it might not be defined. And it is useful for figuring out trans translating Perl compiler errors into human readable text. However, once you use it a few times, you realize that it is, um, all it does is barf stuff out to your terminal and make it impossible to figure out what other output there is. But it's still useful for uh, debugging. There's some other uses of use. Um, you can load modules. You can specify a version along with that module if it will go look for a uh, globally declared version within that module and try to figure out if it's uh, greater than or equal to that version. And it will fail if it can't find it. Um, use feature is a, just uses a, enables a feature of the language. Perl has been developed incrementally over time and you have, and a lot of features have been added with each version of the language. So in this case, state here will enable state variables. Um, state variables are a, a Perl contract where you have, say you have a subroutine and you, and you have a constant defined at the top of the subroutine and you only want to be visible within that subroutine. If you have state, it will set, use state x equals 42, that variable will be initialized to 42 in that function. But if you go into that again, or if you change it later, it will not be reinitialized. So if you, for some reason, the ultimate answer to the ultimate question became 43, and you incremented it in that function, it would remain 43 for, forever. It's a uh, useful, it, it, it saves, it uh, ugh, can give you some performance boosts. Use lib can just uh, augments the library path, and that's, that's pretty much all there is to that one. Um, use constant defines uh, compile time constants into, the co into your program. Um, these are effectively defined as subroutines that return, just return the value and are inline, generally inlined by the compiler. This is a nice way to introduce constants into your code because Perl doesn't really give you a good way of doing that otherwise. And this funky looking thing at the bottom here so makes you, you requires your power compiler to be version five, subversion 14, minor version four. It is the old way of specifying the Perl compile, uh, the version of the Perl compiler. And also, what this will do is this will enable all of the features associated with that particular Perl version. So one of the things that was introduced in a relatively new Perl version is the function say, which in, is just like print, except it prints a new line out at the end, which is a, a bit convenient, which can be convenient. I use it in a few places in my demonstrations. And also, after like Perl 5.10, I believe, you can, it enables strict, too, because there's no excuse not to use strict in any uh, well-organized Perl script. And the developers agree with that idea. All right, let's talk about the bread and butter of programming, variables. There are at least four types of variables in Perl. These are the ones I've seen. There are scalars, arrays, hashes, and type blobs. Scalars are your standard scalar type. You have integers or strings or references, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Arrays are any list of scalars, so just a, your standard array construct. Zero points to, zero points to some scale or one point to another scale or two, so on and so forth. Hashes are your standard mapping type. You can map one scalar to another scalar. And those are also the bread and butter of a lot of a structural type, uh, structural programming done in uh, all sorts of languages, Python, a lot of Python stuff uses things like that too. Type globs. Type globs are interesting. You can't actually write them like that in your code. You have to use a backslash. I think uh, LaTeX ate my uh, backslash there. But what those, those are every type at the same time. They were uh, required back in the day to uh, 
use what references are now used for. Well, once again, I'll talk about references later, but you need them in modern Perl to have function local file handles. And those are used moderately often, and that's where you see them. This is a, a better explained in the uh, almighty Perl documentation. It's very, it's very good documentation, by the way. Scoping. Uh, when you use strict, you were required to give all your variables some sort of scope. And, this, and in Perl, there are generally three types of scope that people will tend to use, uh, my, r, and local, although people don't usually use local. Uh, my is private scope, r is global scope, local is what is called dynamic scope. Uh, private scope is, as it sounds, just is only visible in its scope or its subscopes. So you have a, so if you define a my variable globally in your module, it will not be accessible outside the module, but every single other, inst every single other part of the functions within the module or straight code within that module will be able to read the value of that variable. Our makes a, a true global variable. It will be accessible from anywhere. If you uh, need to use it from outside your current module, you have to reference the whole module name or import it. Um, importing is a, a topic that is explained well in the Perl documentation. Local is interesting. Dynamic scope is something that isn't really talked about because it is uh, very confusing. However, it is um, kind of, it's, it's just an interesting thing to under, try to take a look at. So I got a little example of it. So we defi I define a, x, a um, global variable x, that's as a string global variable, and then I have a subroutine called fn that goes and prints it. It just goes and prints the global variable x followed by a new line string. However, what I have here is I have making a new scope and saying local x to the string dynamic override. And then I'm calling a function. So what this will do is that setting this local here will override the value of the global variable x within this scope block. So what this function will print out, it'll print out this string, not this string. However, when you leave the scope, you, the local ceases to exist, and, it'll, and when I call the function again, it will print out the global variable. I got a demo for this. Um, oh, right. Better show the code first. Yeah, all right. So there's that. There is the code pretty much I had there, except unfortunately some of the, uh, the colors don't get inverted on the terminal like they do on the slides. Sorry about that, but it's the exact. It's just it's the exact same code you have I had up on the slides. Okay. Another thing about Perl that you see everywhere, anywhere, and everywhere is context. Depending on how you where you how you use variables, the uh, meaning or, or functions in this or in this case, the meaning of values can change. So I have this function called local time that returns the local time in some way, shape, or form. And it acts differently depending on how you interpret it as a, as a um, array or as a uh, scalar. So I got this code out to Oh, yeah, that's much better. So it's pretty much a calling those functions I uh, described. So let's run, the, run this thing. Holy moly, what is this? That, uh, when interpreted in array context, uh, local time returns the uh, list, returns the time as a list. It breaks it up into each individual constructs, year, month, day, minute, hour, minute, second, that sort of thing, and returns it as a list. And of course, when you print out a, when you just call print on an array, it returns everything not separated by any spaces, which in that case is absolute gibberish. But in the scalar context, it pretty prints the string. I mean, that also makes sense, right? When you want a scale or representing the time, you don't want each individual component of the time. You want the time. You want the time as something maybe human readable. If you want to do further processing on the time, you get the, you get the list of the contract, the list of the time, like in the C, in C programs, and then manipulate there. Perl also has a, a stir time function that you can use to uh, 
chop that up and pretty print it how you like. So, yeah, a lot of the, when you do you change the context of variables in the, with their, just like variables, Perl just is able to, the compiler knows what context it's in, right? But local time's a function. Function is zero, but this is actually Perl code here, or maybe C, Perl code call from C, C code call from Perl, or something like that. But how does it know, or how can you write things that are aware of context like local time is? Well, there's a function for that. It's called want array. Depending on how you call the func, depending on the, what it returns, you can go and determine what context it's in and change what the function does accordingly. So in this case, I call the function, first I check for the func whether the want array returns a true value. If it is, it's in, a, it's in an array context. If it, if it is defined, but it's false, because a true would have been bypass, would have been skipped, would have been detected there, is in the scalar context. If want array returns an undefined value, it returns void. It returns, is in the void context, meaning it, ha, meaning it operates entirely by side effect. And I have an example of this too. So I got that function. I got the function as I described in there. I'm using Perl 514, so I can get access to the function say. And I am calling the function print context in array context, scalar context, and avoid context. Therefore, this will return those very those uh, strings in that order, like so. Uh, for a further explanation of this, this is kind of uh, considered black magic for obvious reasons. Um, this, the Perl documentation gives you a, gives a very, good very good example of how this works. Um, also, there is a, if you need to get even deeper into this, if you want to determine exactly what's being say, what the precise context is, say you're having a scalar and you don't know whether it's a reference or not, you could go, there's a module, CPN module called want that generalizes this even further if you want to use such a thing. Usually want to array appears to be enough for most people's purposes. Okay. And now we get into the simpler, some of the simpler stuff. Uh, Perl has a string quoting that resembles um, that of shell scripting. You, I set a value x to 42. Single quoting interpolates variables within the strings. Double quoting, single quoting does not, double quoting does. So in this case, the string A will be $x is the answer to the ultimate question, slap backslash n, and B will be dollar sign at, I'm sorry, 42 is the answer to the ultimate question followed by an actual new line character. Um, the only way to get the uh, new line character out of Perl is to use double quotes on it. And that's, otherwise, it, otherwise the single quotes won't, will just not escape it. Comparison operators. One of the things that tripped me up early in Perl is that there are two different types of comparison operators. There's ones for strings and ones for numerical values. So when you define a, uh, say, uh, say I find x and y to strings equal 42 and 42.0 .0 respectively, Perl treats all new numbers as floats unless you tell it not to. That's uh, another compiler directive I didn't mention. Um, it will convert them to numbers and compare them immediately. So 42 is obviously equal to 42, right? But they're also strings. So if I do string equality on them, if I do a uh, dollar $x equal eq dollar $y, they will not be the same because 42 is not equal, the string 42 is not equal to the string 42.0. I've made lots of uh, mistakes in my code, like that's a good thing to be aware of. And there's also this other comparison operator. The, uh, there's an operator that returns negative one, zero, or one if the, val if the left value is less than, greater, equal to, or greater than the right value. This is most useful in um, sorting. And this, uh, this is a format that actually the C sort function expects, and it's also the, function val the uh, format that the uh, Perl sort function expects. I'll, talk about that briefly in a moment. And there, it comes, also comes in string and numerical varieties 
and not in that order at all. Number formatting, this is a kind of a dumb sort of feature, but say you have a large, large number and you want to make it kind of readable. Well, you can insert underscores into it, single underscores anywhere within the number, and it will still be interpreted as a part of that number, but it will still be the number. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, and then I put a bunch of underscores in it to separate out the individual blocks of the number. And they, oh, I don't actually, I didn't actually write this example out, but they, it will be the same number. It's useful for like if you have, you're writing out the integer a million, and you need to make sure that you're actually writing a million, writing the right number of zeros in there. It's a mistake I've made too. Arrays, arrays are your standard array construct. You have, a, they're initialized by using parentheses, and they contain any old block of scalars. So I got the one, quote, the string two, the string number, numeral three, and the scalar value four, and they're zero indexed. To get at them, you just put them into a scalar context and then dereference them like any old C array, like that. So there's two ways to get a array length. I keep on forgetting how to do this, unfortunately. So you have the array. One way to get the length of the array is to interpret it into a scalar context, and so that will, when that variable len there will be the length of the array. However, there's another way to get the last index, the, the last, the length of the array. That is the last index. That is the dollar pound construct. So if you put dollar pound in front of the name of, the name of an array, what will happen is that will be the that will be the last index of the array. However, that is also what Perl uses to determine what the length of the array is. So if you can actually change that value, and it will uh, truncate the, expand or truncate the array. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah, what happens when you just reference the array as a scalar? You get the length, which is uh, precisely what's happening there. Right, but it's dollar a. Uh, no, you have to, uh, you can, f so the question originally was what happens if you just put the uh, reference the array as a scalar? Um, you, it will be undefined because there is no scalar A. Sorry, I, didn't, I misinterpreted your question. Um, each individual variable type has have an associated sigil with it. That's the uh, character in front of it. If the about if it's not what it's expecting to it, you can have like a variable A and a list A and a hash A, but you never want to do that because then your code would become very difficult to read. So yeah, don't do that. So I mentioned array sorting earlier, and here it is. So I have a, a, list, a, a list A that contains the strings 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. QW takes, the, uh, takes a list of words separated by spaces and then chops them up into individual words. And in this case, sort here will take a, will take a function, it takes a, a code block or a function that, takes, that contains two special variables, A and B, the two variables to be compared. And it expects the uh, same format of ne negative one, zero, or one, depending on how you want it to be positioned, positioned in the array. Um, in this case, A and B are special. They are, they, in this case, they, all, they, they, they had this meaning in this context. Um, in other contexts, A, you can have an A and B any old place how you want. But it's, uh, that's, what, that's the convention used inside sort. Slices, what's another thing you can do with arrays and pearls? You can chop them up into little pieces and then use them in other parts of your code. So, you have an, so I have an array there, A. I can slice it up by using individual indexes. I can take the second and the fourth one to get to make a list containing two and four. I can pass a range into it or even a list of values into it and get, the, get that list. So like C there will be the values of two, three, and four from the indexes one to three. Or you can go and reassign things. You can even reassign the slices. So that one there, the bottom one there, is a ra I'm assigned, reassigning the entire range of the array to four, five values four, five, six, and seven. The reason you can do this is because the uh, slices are soft copies of the array. Meaning, if you if I start changing the values in B, it would start affecting it would affect the values in A. Uh, there are other means to do copies, and this is not one of those things you should use copies for. You should, if you need a deep copy of the array, do not use slices. This is more of a useful, uh, say you need to iterate over a section of the array. Use a slice. That sort of thing. 
So Perl hashes. Hashes are your standard mapping type. You can, they're constructed pretty much identically to lists, as you can see there with a slight difference. Um, you dereference them, get the values out of them by putting the, uh, by referencing in a scalar context and using curly braces and then throwing the value in there like so. And you can define new values in as needed. And one of the things that you notice here is that even though this whole construct looks like a list, what's this here? Um, and in fact, it actually is a list. It will be interpreted as a list. If you made an array constructor like this as a list, it would be able to uh, be interpreted as an array. But the arrow operator in that case is comma with a slight twist. So no, everything in Perl needs to have, usually has to have a sigil in front of it unless it's a function, right? Well, unless it's, or it's a number. These don't. This is because this arrow operator instructs Perl to quote this value here. So if you put a sigil value there, it would be quoted by, it would be quoted by Perl. And that is generally, that's also generally how uh, these values are, uh, how hashes or hash constructors are differentiated from array constructors, since otherwise the only way you can tell the difference is the uh, percent sign on the left. So here's a, something I encountered in my travels. So I have an array here. I have one, two, and then the value. Then another array inside of it containing, the value, containing some more values, and then another value after the end of it. And so I'm forcing the, uh, in this case, I'm forcing the array into a list context, or, ah, array into a scalar context to get the uh, length of the list, and I am attacking a new line onto it to print out the value. So, um, so there are, from a first glance here, there would be uh, four elements in this list because you have uh, one value here, two, and then this whole list is a third, and then a fourth. Um, how many of you think think it's, uh, that's what's going to happen here? Of course not. I totally stepped over myself there. Um, so in fact, I totally failed on that. It's six. Why is it six? It's six because this, because Perl says, sees this thing and is like, wait, this isn't a scalar. This is a list. You can't have lists and lists, so I'm just going to go flatten out the array for you. And that's why it has the length of six. I have encountered that problem a few times myself. And there is a, well, that'd be kind of a problem, couldn't it? That means you couldn't have like hashes containing lists either, since lists are constructs. You can't have nested data structures, right? So let's think for a moment here. Let's think about what C does in these sorts of things. What C does in these sorts of things is that C goes and chop takes uses pointers everywhere. So you have pointers, so you have lists, arrays containing pointers to, ob to objects that may are somewhere out in the somewhere out in memory. And Perl does almost the exact same thing. Then the structure called references. It wraps potentially a pointer in a scalar, except you can't seg fault them, which is nice. You can still, you can still uh, crash, you can still crash Perl with them too. It's uh, not a uh, uncommon occurrence. So in this case, I have a nested, I am nesting arrays here, array references here. So I define the scalar value x to be zero, one, then a list containing a list, and then some more values after that. And you deref, and you get the values out of them by using arrows, kind of like in what C does. So in this case, this will get the third value, which is the third value here, which is this list, then the first value of that list, which is this list, array ref rather, and then the second value of this one, which is 2.11. There's another uh, construct there that I mentioned there. You can go and just have a multidimensional array dereference, kind of like in what C does. It's, uh, I haven't actually had a use for it, since most of my uh, multidimensional array processing is being done in other languages. That's uh, something to keep in mind. All right, so any language is going to complete without the without special variables now, is it? Uh, there is uh, one variable in Perl that everyone likes. What is it? The underscore. The underscore. Everyone loves the underscore. 
It is the reason why, one of the big reasons why Perl is considered to be an unreadable mess. And here's why. So, or here's why not. So here is just a simple looping construct. We have for each, for each variable v in some array, if it matches a regular expression foo, we print it out, right? This makes perfect sense here. So let's use an example that has the dollar, uses dollar underscore instead, right? So for each value in some array, print it if it matches the regular expression foo. Well, this kind of makes sense too, right? But it's using the dollar underscore variable. When you don't specify a variable for a for construct, it defaults to dollar underscore. But there's a lot of functions and internal structures that use dollar underscore implicitly if you don't specify value to the function. So here it just prints nothing. In this case, we'll try to print out the value of dollar underscore implicitly. If you have just have a regular expression match, it will attempt to apply the regular expression to the value of dollar underscore. Um, in this case, it, it's pretty clear what this is doing. So um, what's the problem here? The problem is that when you start, see, when you see, start, start seeing people write it out, you start losing what context it's in. The dollar underscore variable can, is, can and probably should be treated like a pronoun. If you, could loo, if you could somehow lose the context of it, you probably should not be using, using it. You should not be using it directly. You should either be using it implicitly or not at all. And that is a best practice for it. If you don't want to use it, if you want to use it, don't write it out. There's a there's some cases in which you do want to write it out, and those are these. There are two functions that take uh, little blocks of code or code or subroutine references, and you can pass an array to them, and it'll do, it'll do functions on the array. So let's go into these a little more detail. So map is your standard map function. What map does is that it takes a list, applies a function to it, and makes a new list containing the results of that function apply to each element of that list. That's pretty simple there, right? So when you have the blocks in the map and grep functions, the variable that represents the element of the array is the dollar underscore variable. So in this case, you have to use it. But here, it's pretty obvious where it is. It's being constrained, the instance dollar underscore is being constrained at this little uh, parenthesis defined scope here. If you pass a, a, co a subroutine reference to this function, it does not have to be, I do not believe it has to be dollar underscore. It will just, you can just use something else instead. Grep is a little more special. What grep does, grep is essentially a filter. In this case, it will go and grab out the numbers of the, in this case, it'll filter a list of numbers for all values that are greater than zero and return into, an, into a new list. But you can also use it in a scalar context to just get the count of the positive numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Um, what else? Another thing you can do is in a sort of a text processing thing. If you put a file handle in list context, it will attempt, Perl will attempt to slurp up the entire file handle. And you can have some function here that does like a regular expression match. And it will be essentially pretty much grep with the regular expression. And thus, why it's named that way. There's some bunch of other useful special variables. Um, the dollar pipe variable at the top there is one you see pretty often, may see pretty often in production code. What it does is that if, you, if it's set to one, it, it enables, a, it disables input buffering, output buffering, which is a useful thing to have. Um, what the uh, dollar forward slash variable does is that it, it when you uh, set that, that value is determined what, when you take input by line in Perl, say you just, you take a scale, you have a file handle, and then you take the value of all, we want to read out from a line from it. It looks for a variable, looks for, slurps up a string up to the point it finds a ma value matching the, uh, that variable there, the dollar forward slash variable. In shell, like in shell scripts, dollar zero is the name of the uh, program being called, or however it's being called. Argv contains the list of arguments starting, but not, it does not contain the program name though. It's another thing that periodically trips me up. Um, ink, the array ink is the um, include paths, what, where you are loading Perl libraries from. It's useful for uh, diagnostic purposes. If you need to extend it, use, uh, use lib. So what you should be doing there. 
Um, the, in cache, it shows you a list of all the modules loaded pointing to where they were loaded from. So say you have multiple versions sitting on your file system and you just want to, and you want to make sure you're loading it from the right place or make sure it was loaded from the right place, you can use ink to do, the ink cache to do it. Um, there's also env. Env is the system environment's modifiable as a hash. It's a, that's pretty much enough said there. It makes it X6 controlling the environment a bit more convenient. Sig is for signal handlers. You can define, in, like you can define using this hash, you can point, having perfect point to a code reference that has a custom interrupt handler. So if you have a script that's doing some operation and gets interrupted and you want it to clean up a little bit before it dies, you can set that thing to a, uh, a subroutine, set that to a subroutine. It will call that function when it receives interrupt signal or most other signals. There are some other ways to do this that are more programmatic, but that's the uh, quick way to do it. And now you have all these use special variables. There's a, a lot of them have uses. There's one I found that does not really have much of a use. It's this one, the dollar open left bracket. What, it, what this one does is that if you set this variable, it changes the starting, default starting index of arrays. Why would you ever want to do that sort of thing? Yeah, if you, yes, or if, you're, or if you're a MATLAB programmer or like to program in matrices all the time, that's the only reason why I see you would want to do that, except Perl, no, it's hardly used by anyone. It's gotten to the point where the, in recent versions of Perl, the, uh, ah, you, you have to load a special module just to get access to this variable. It's that kind of abhorred. And now that we've gone through all these variables, Oh, actually, no, there's another one I have forgot here. So how do you get a subroutine? So you have a subroutine. How do you get to the values of the subroutine? Well, you use the underscore list. So in this case, I'm pulling them out of the dollar underscore list using a standard array, con standard array, con array construct. Well, there's another thing to consider here. This is an array construct, right? So when I mentioned earlier that hashes were constructed very similar to arrays, you can exploit that here too and have named arguments, na optional named arguments. So you can, here I'm specifying that A, the value A is one, value B is two, value C is three. And then the first thing I'm doing inside my function, my subroutine there, is casting the argument list into a hash. So in this case, I can, I can determine which, determine op, maybe determine optional variables determine what values name certain B. Maybe I can go and use this to uh, figure out what types things are supposed to be based on how they're called. Maybe use some sort of Hungarian notation. And now I think, yep. So now we get to the part that every single, that one of the, uh, that every single person who's used Perl eventually has to see. It's good old CPAN. What is CPAN? CPAN is the Comprehensive Perl Archive Network. It is the centralized location for Perl module development and distribution, as I've said in the slide. And what is probably a bit more staggering is that it contains over 120,000 Perl modules. That is a lot of modules. And each one of these modules, a lot of these modules are packed into different types, different distributions. There were over 20, like 28,000 distributions last I checked. And there's like, this is a lot of Perl. There's, is, there are, there's little, if anything, that can match the sheer number of things in here. However, this comes with a slight, um, problem with this. So you have all this, all this uh, code lying around, right? It's like, oh yeah, I had this function here, but wait, this, there's already this module that uses the module implements this function in a cool way. Let's use it. And then the module that, that developer, go, module developer says, oh yeah, there's this other cool function this other module wrote. Let's use that. And as you, and I'm sure you can see where this is going, this is, CPAN is often known for massive dependency trees. And if you are using a Linux distribution that does not have uh, good um, dependency resolution methods and you have to do them manually, it becomes a pain. Or if you have to package them yourself, you have to go and individually go and find, you have this Perl module, figure out what the dependencies are. Oh, wait, those are more dependencies. And so on and so on and so on. <laughs> so there are some recommended ways to get around that. Your odd and cases, your distribution's package manager will contain a lot of use CPAN modules already in clean, clean package formats. So a lot of the useful ones are already done. There's like 
Debian has a ton of prepackaged Perl modules. Just you can pull them out from apt and just use them at will. However, if you need to get them otherwise, I would recommend using uh, CPAN. There are, CPAN has a front end that can go and access CPAN and then go recursively install all the dependencies your particular module needs. There are, in the tradition of Perl, having more than one way to do everything, uh, there are three different types of front, there are three, uh, well, three commonly known front ends. Um, there's CPAN, the one that comes with your Perl in general, it's just the standard interface, really. CPAN Plus is kind of like the CPAN interface, except it has a programmable API, which is, can be useful if you need to go and extract Perl module distribution information from uh, CPAN archive. And CPAN minus is um, more of a zero configuration sort of thing. You just say, I want to install these, I want this Perl module installed to this location. And it will go and do that and calculate all the dependencies and do everything else CPAN does. If you need to do something wacky, strange with it, um, uh, you would probably want to use uh, standard CPAN because it is uh, very much, excuse me, is much more configurable. Let's get into some of these modules, shall we? Here's our really useful one. There's this, this module called Data Dumper. What it does is that it goes and figures out the internal details of whatever structure you're passing to it and prints it out in a nice little format. So here I got this large thing here I could, that's a pretty well a large hash reference pointing at as different values using, using different values all over it. And say uh, this is not the module that I'm, say I'm debugging some other sort of module here. I'm passing this large construct from one part of my code to another. It's, it's procedurally generated. I don't know what it looks like, right? So that's this module here. Well, let me do that. So I will go from this right now. Oh, and that uh, V up here, this thing here, is the same sort of thing as the uh, use, fi use 5014 contract. Ver Pro provides a version structure that can be used for that sort of thing. Uh, documentation provides more information on what that does. OK, see? It just prints out the um, structure in a uh, pretty format. Of course, if you have recursive structures, this could, ca this could cause a massive balloon of uh, data structure definition to hit your terminal, but uh, you can, there are other routines that can go and uh, make limit recur how recursively you go. In a lot of cases, you only want to see the, uh, the first object you're in, not the, not, how, not the entire depth of the tree. So, of course, in the tradition of CPAN, there is a module that finds CPAN dependencies. And this one's, uh, let's, it'll take a little moment. So, what this little block of code is doing, so I'm loading the modules. Um, time high res is a mod, is a included module for abuse of like, High resolution time, it knows about micro, it knows about mi microseconds. Normal Perl does not only knows, I think it only knows about like milliseconds or seconds. Um, used for 514, used strict. Um, one way to extract the, the, this uh, dollar uh, caret v variable is the current Perl version we're using. In this case, I'm using Perl uh, 5.16.3. It'll uh, go and just store it, print that value out as a string and store it to, the vari to, to that variable. Uh, make some mod names, um, setting and getting the current time for the inter to determine how long this is going to, this operation is going to take. And then I go and find the, call it to find the dependencies for this current Perl version and get the time print out, print out the tree, its dependencies, and say how long it took. Is it done yet? Yeah, it is. All right. So let's just zoom out here a little bit. All these modules are needed, apparently, to uh, determine how many, determine the uh, c dependencies of an individual CPAN module without recursively building it. I think it's 71 dependencies. This is a rather, this is a, this is, I consider this to be a rather uh, ironic bit of CPAN. Believe it or not, I've actually found a use for this thing. I don't know how I did it, though. So one thing about Perl, you pass subroutine arguments into Perl, and then you say, oh, here's a bunch of subroutine arguments. Okay, 
how do I make sure that they're the right subroutine arguments? That's what this module is good for. It can take, it takes a specification of the arguments of the, uh, of your function, and it goes and you can have it do regular expression processing, you can have it check for types, you can have it check for what objects being passed into it, Perl has object oriented programming constructs. And it's, I found it to be a, a useful way to determine whether, to make sure your functions are being called correctly. You can also, once you have, use it as a development aid, and then when you're done with it, you can um, turn it off. There's a global variable you can set for that. Moose, so Perl object oriented programming for anyone that has done it is kind of clunky. It's, so each Perl object is associated with a, a particular module or Perl package. And the only difference between a, uh, like a hash reference, which is just a reference of thing to name the value construct, and an object in Perl or standard Perl object is that the standard Perl object knows what object it's called being called from. Rather, knows what module it's being called from. So when you call methods from it, it says, oh yeah, I'm going to want to call this, this function of this module with the first argument being the name of the name of, first argument being the structure containing the object. It's sort of kind of like Python where you have to explicitly say the first argument is me to any old function. And what Moose does is that Moose takes all that stuff and throws it out of a window. It makes it all, it, make, it gives you standard, nice meta object programming in Perl. Like Python, it matches kind of what Python's capable of doing. I never actually used it, but it was enough, this module was enough to make some peop, people who write this old module, like this old, really old module named Mason, called Mason. This guy said like, Oh, there's this really cool thing called Moose. I'm going to rewrite Mason using this, using Moose. And that was a, and that is, that is kind of really big praise. It, this, its reputation essentially precedes itself. It's that good. Carp. So one of the things about Perl when you have little messages, it doesn't actually give you, always give you a good information. So you say, so you have code that just goes and spontaneously dies at some random line here, or rather you want to exit at some line. So there's functions called, there's a function called die for that, or you can use this function called croak, which, no, don't do that. Uh, croak, which goes and uh, it does the same thing, but you can enable, set a value globally that will go and cause it to print out like a stack trace. Um, carp is sort of the same thing, but with, uh, with warnings. And confess and cluck are croak and carp, except they always print out stack traces. This is for, use, or used for exceptional circumstances. So you might be thinking to yourself, so what if I always want stack traces? Python always gives me stack traces, right? There's a module for that too. So there is a module called carp always on CPAN that will always print out stack traces when you encounter errors or warnings. So I got an example for that too. So I'm trying to get this thing to print out in some circuitous manner to print out. This is being demoed at Southeast Linux Fest. But I made, a little bu I made a little typo somewhere. I forgot to go and specify some, I forgot to pass some argument to a function. So I'm just saying uninitialized value of x and concatenation of string and blah, 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 line 17. Well, let's take a look at that. So here it is. I have a function, I'm calling function A with Southeast Linux Fest is passing the argument to B and B is not passing the argument to C, which is where the problem actually lies. I'm pulling the argument out of, out, of the, out of the function in C and then dropping it into a string that's being returned from there. That is all self-explanatory, right? I obviously know here from looking at the code that a problem is it didn't pass the arguments through B. But what if I didn't know that? What if I'm dealing with a humongous tangled mess of Perl modules and I can't figure out what exa where exactly I'm failing. So that's what stack traces are useful for. No, don't run that. So I'm running the module, I'm loading the module at, at um, loading the module before the script's being run, which is what the uh, dash m flag does there, just the name of the module. And then the name of the script. Hey, look. 
my warning comes with a stack trace now. I, I, when I was uh, debugging some of my um, production code, I found this uh, script to be uh, very, very helpful for tracking down errors because sometimes I just make some silly little mistake that wouldn't be, you can't catch things like passing undefined values into certain operators using, using confess and clock and carp and the, that module. You have, to, you, you have to just hook into it and get something like this. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, something I kind of wish was in Perl by default, but what do you say? What do you know? It's a module in the, it's, there's a module for it if you want to install the module. In fact, a lot of these modules, except for like maybe CP and find dependencies, are in Debian, are in Debian repositories. There is a uh, lib uh, carp always Perl package you can get in Debian that will give you this Perl module. Okay. And the last module I'm going to talk about is Devel MYT Prof. So no good programming language would be really good without a way to figure out how long, figure out where your code bottlenecks are, right? You want, we want a code profiler. So I took the liberty of running my, running MYT prof on the, that CPAN find dependency script I got here. And uh, here is one of the things. It outputs a file, and it, can, it contains a module that can go and convert all of that stuff to HTML. So it splits off. It can figure, it tells you what the top file, how long these subroutines took, uh, how long each, mo how much time was spent in each module. As you can see, there are a lot of modules here. And it gives, you even line by line gives you what functions were being called in that module, and then it gives you how much time it's spent at each individual line in the code. This is the real deal, or so I uh, like to believe. Yeah, I would have run it here, but uh, when I tried to run it at, uh, earlier, it took over five minutes to uh, profile the uh, that many statements and that many subroutine calls. That's a lot of, this is a lot of Perl to do a small thing. And that, however, it's all a little, it's all a little box in CPAN. And that is why CPAN is nice to have if you can get around all of the uh, dependency problems that kind of plague it. Those are, those are indeed legitimate problems. But CPAN, it, they're, the CPAN applications do a pretty good job of uh, paring it down for you a bit. All right. So documentation. There is lots of Perl documentation lying around you can, or other sorts of resources. So perldoc.perl.org contains the comprehensive list of Perl documentation avail available in the core Perl distribution. Um, it's the same sort of stuff that's uh, available offline in Perl. You can access it using a Perl doc command there. Um, you also, the documentate those pro, the Perl doc and Perl is also generally documented in man pages. Though if you want to get at individual functions, you have to use Perl doc or the, uh, or use the online documentation, the uh, documentation web browser. And of course, there's CPAN. CPAN always goes in uh, CPAN is a good source for module documentation. Module C, modules in CPAN tend to be very well documented. Um, I wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to do a lot with them if they weren't, considering it somehow some of them are written. Um, and also it's where you can find new modules that may be able to do some little piece of functionality that you didn't have before. There are web templating engines. There are database interfaces. There, is an ob there are object relational models for databases. Um, Almost every single thing you could maybe you will want to do with a Perl script is probably already in CPAN, and you could almost take advantage. Of, you can take advantage of almost immediately by just downloading, installing the modules. Fortunately, I can't account for all. Sometimes, depending on how people write them, they just have this. There's this dependency problem, but disk space is cheap these days, right? All right, and that's all I got for now.
Um, I have, uh, I believe I have five minutes left in the talk. I can take uh, questions until then if you have any. Um, so the question was, um, how, how is the uh, functional side of Perl? Um, Perl supports um, first class functions. You can define subroutines um, and then reference them later using, uh, using the at sign. You just you reference it with the backslash. It's so like look up code references in there. And also with those little code blocks in map and grep and sort, those are in fact also first class functions. So it, it supports pretty much any paradigm of programming you would probably want to have. It doesn't force it upon you either. Yes, Jeff. When you were defining a range earlier, you used uh, parentheses concept or parentheses for one step, and you used square brackets for another. What's the distinction between the two? Um, arrays, you said? Uh, you were defining the value for arrays. Uh, yes. So the difference between the square brackets and the round, the round parentheses in the, in the here is that this is being defined as an array reference, oh. not an array. Um, when so if you pretty much, okay. it's pre it's pretty much constructing the, constructing it as an array, constructing it as an array reference. If you wanted to make a hash reference instead, you would use curly braces okay. instead of square braces. All right, we we'll call it a wrap. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You'll have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. 
started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. Cloudstack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloudstack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions 
they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.